Okay, hi Math352, we're back, we're up to lecture 22, which is in fact the last lecture that we're going to have for this course. And what we're going to look at today is we're going to look at applying our ideas of quadratic programming in a more general optimization context. Now I've decided that today's lecture is not going to be examinable, so some of these things I'm not going to cover in much depth. What I'm trying to give you today is a bit of a flavour about what kinds of work you can do with this in the future as you go on to do other courses and hopefully give you a bit of a feel about the directions yeah, that you'll be able to go with this material. Okay, so we're going to start by looking at a more general unconstrained minimization problem. So now what we're going to look at using to solve this is something called Newton's method for unconstrained minimization. Now this is one of a couple of things called Newton's method that you'll come across. And they're all kind of essentially similar, but the Newton's method that you will have met is probably the one for solving for zeros of a function. Okay, this is actually similar in flavor, but we're actually using it to minimize a function rather than solving for a zero. Okay, so given optimization problem, no constraints, We want to minimize over x some function f of x. Okay, where f is convex, and <coughs> so f looks like this. In 1D it looks like that, in 2D it looks like a bowl or something like that. But it's convex. Just remember our pictorial definition of convex. If you draw a line segment between any two points, that line segment will sit above the function. Okay, so you should be able to tell that if we can find a minimum of this function, then that will be the global minimizer for the problem. So the question is, how can we find a minimizer of this function in an efficient kind of way? Okay, so that's our problem. Well, what we do is we start by taking a Taylor approximation of our function. So, a second order Taylor approximation of our function. is f hat, sorry, f, I should say f at, at, a, at a point x, f hat of x plus h, so if I take a small step in some direction, that gives me f of x plus the gradient of f of x transpose h, if I've got enough space, plus one half h transpose hessian, of f times h. Okay, so that's a quadratic function, and that's my second order Taylor approximation of f. Okay, so just remember that grad f is the gradient, grad squared f here is the Hessian. Now what we know, as f is convex, our Hessian is positive definite. Okay, and I might just start labeling some equation numbers here. Um, let's call this one equation 1 and this one equation 2. So 2 has a minimizer. Okay, we've got quadratic function. We know if the, if the matrix in the quadratic, the quadratic matrix, the Hessian is positive definite, then our function has a minimizer. And if it's positive definite, it's unique. At h equals negative p squared q. And our q is grad f. Okay, since f is twice... <coughs> Well, we're assuming it is. So since um, f is twice differentiable, that just means we can take second derivatives, basically. Um, if x is near our 
global optimum. So this is x star f of x star. Then our quadratic then the quadratic approximation should be very accurate. Okay, and x plus h should be a good estimate. of x star. Okay, so what we're doing is basically we're saying, alright, I'm going to take my f my function, I'll take a point nearby, if I basically find the quadratic that matches the derivative and the second derivative of my function here, which might look like this, that might be the quadratic you get, then the minimizer of that quadratic is going to be a very good estimate, especially if we're nearby, to the minimizer of our function f. Okay, that's basically what we're saying here. So in Newton's method, we move to a point x plus t h. Okay, we don't necessarily move to the point x plus h because if we're further away then that might get us too far away. Okay, so we go through a procedure that I'll explain in a second called backtracking line search to choose a value of t between 0 and 1 to move to. Okay, so we can think of this h. When we're computing this h here, you can think of that as a step in the right direction. Okay, so we know if we step in that direction we will end up at a lower point. And hopefully we can take the full step and get to our minimizer of the quadratic, but sometimes we need to take a smaller one just to be, well, kind of to be on the safe side. Okay, so how we choose the length of the step, or the number, the value of t, I'll explain in a moment. But for, the, for now, we've got, just assume we've got a procedure for choosing a suitable t between 0 and 1, um, where t is chosen by a procedure called backtracking line search, which once again I'll explain in a moment. And we repeat. Okay, so let's just write down the algorithm. Um, step one. Compute the Newton step. h equals negative Hessian inverse times gradient. 2. Here's our exit condition. We stop if if our function evaluated at, if I'm um, sorry, let's write, write that in a place with a bit more space. We stop if our function evaluated at x minus our function evaluated sorry, our quadratic approximation evaluated at x plus h which equals, now basically if you just plug that h in to our expression for our Taylor pr approximation, this is what you get. And this is called the Newton decrement. And if that's less than or equal to some prescribed tolerance, then we can stop. Okay, step three we choose a step size by backtracking line search. So I'll just explain that procedure in a moment. And then we update x to x plus t times h, and we do it again. 
Okay, so basically run through this loop until we hit the exit condition. Okay, now I keep mentioning this backtracking line search idea, so let's just quickly explain what that looks like. So backtracking line search, I'm not going to spend time um, explaining the algorithm in any, in any detail here. But what it does is it basically ensures that we get a sufficiently large decrease in our function for, without making our step size too small. So it might be something that you might want to have a bit of a think about, but like I said, I'm just giving you a bit of a flavor today. So given an alpha in that interval, these are parameters of the backtracking, backtracking line search um, procedure, and beta from there, and a step direction h, then we let t equal 1, then while, so while f of x plus th is greater than f of x um, plus alpha t grad f um, of x transpose h, we multiply t by our parameter beta. Okay, so let's just have a quick look at what this does. Um, this quantity here, that tells you, that kind of gives you the linear approximation as to where you're going to end up. So if you, look, if you just go back for a second to our Taylor approximation, that term is this one here, scaled by our t, essentially. Okay, so this is going to be negative, just to avoid getting confused here. So this says that um, while our approximation is greater than f of x minus some amount, okay, so while our approximation is still is still higher than we want it to be, we make our step shorter by multiplying it by this parameter beta, and do it again. Okay, now like I said, I'm not going to go into this. If you do if you do the honors course next year on unconstrained optimization, you'll go into studying this a bit more closely, but we're just presenting it as a high level idea here. So essentially we can just plug, we can plug it in and it will give us a t that is suitable, it gives us a suitable decrease in our function. Okay, so what we've done here is we've applied our unconstrained QP to solve a sequence of, well our method for that, to solve a sequence of quadratic, quadratic programming, so quadratic programs that result from Taylor approximations of our function. Okay, and putting that all together, that gives us, if we do this sequentially, that gives us our Newton's method for minimizing a convex function. Okay, it doesn't have to be a convex function, it can be any function in the vicinity of a local minimum, in fact. So if you take a function that looks like this, once again I'll just look at the, look at a 1D example, but if you've got a function that looks like that, then our function is convex in this region here. So if we start in here, then our Newton's method will be able to find this minimizer. Okay? Right. What if we don't have an unconstrained problem? What if we've got equality constraints? So let's try that next. Whoops. So now we're making our, progr our problem a bit harder. So again, we'll assume f of x is convex. Our problem is minimize over x, f of x, subject to now, a set of equality linear equality, or affine equality constraints, ax equals b. Okay, we can actually use exactly the same approach. We use the same approach. Okay, so equation 2, that's our Taylor expansion, becomes minimize over h f hat of x plus h. Okay, so we're still taking our Taylor 
expansion equals f of x plus uh, plus let's just move our line away <laughs> half uh, h transpose hessian h subject to a x plus h equals b and if you expand that out you get a x which is b plus a h and you can cancel off the b's that's equivalent to a h equals zero all right so what we have here is when we're trying to minimize our quadratic subject to the equality constraints we've got an eqp okay so we can find our step h by solving an eqp by for example the kkt method this constrained quadratic problem can be solved for the Newton step by using KKT equations for an EQP. Okay, so again we're we're drawing on our knowledge of um we're drawing on our knowledge of quadratic programming, this this time equality constraint problems, to solve for the Newton step in our convex optimization problem. So what do these equations look like? Well, the matrix, which we've been calling P, is our Hessian. We've got the usual A constraints and a zero here. And now we've got the step H, and I'll call the Lagrange multipliers W. And on the right, we get negative Q, so negative grad F. And we get B, which here is zero, because our constraints in H are AH equals zero. Okay. So the resulting step H is used in Newton's method as before. Okay, now I think that's very nice because we've made our problem harder by restricting it to a particular space. However, um, we can essentially use exactly the same ideas, minimizing the Taylor, the second order Taylor approximation, which is a quadratic, subject to still some equality constraints. So we just need to pull out our EQP equations. They let us solve for a Newton step. We can then apply a Newton's method algorithm just like before, except now that our H is going to come from the KKT equations, and everything else works exactly the same. So Solving equality constrained problem is not really much harder than solving an unconstrained problem by Newton's method. Okay, so that's about all I'm going to do on that part. So what we're going to do next is look at a more general problem. Consider, so what we'll call a general convex problem. Now what I'm going to teach you now is something that you really should spend a lot of time over if you want to do it properly, but we can get the idea quite quickly and it's quite it's nice enough that I want to show you guys before this course finished. Okay, so I want to minimize our objective f naught of x subject to some inequality constraints and a set of equality constraints and we'll say we've got M inequalities. Okay, we're F0 through to Fm are all convex and twice continuously differentiable And our matrix A 
is in R P by in with P less than N and is full rank. Okay, so all I've done is set up a general definition of a convex optimization problem. Okay, one thing to note this includes all problems that we have studied. in this course so far. Okay, now what we do is we actually can apply a similar technique. We can apply Newton's method to this problem once we do a little bit of trickery to get it into a slightly nicer format. Okay, so we can incorporate the constraints. So we know that, sorry, before I do that, but we know that Newton's method We've figured out a way of implementing Newton's method when we've got a convex um, objective function subject to some equality constraints. So far, when we've met inequality constraints in this course, we've resorted to some kind of combinatorial approach, like an active set method or the simplex method, to choose sets of um, sets of inequalities that need to be satisfied with equality. Here, we're going to go for a different approach, and we're going to actually approximate these inequalities by continuous functions in our objective. So that sounds really weird, so a bit, let's, just, let's just see what it looks like. So we can incorporate the constraints into the objective in the following way. Minimize f naught of x plus the sum from i equals 1 to m of i minus of fi of x. I'll define that in a second. Subject to ax equals b. Okay, so what have we got here? We've got a objective f naught of x plus some weird looking sum subject to some equality constraints. So this looks vaguely in the kind of format we're aiming for, although I haven't really said anything about what this is yet. So what this function here is, is basically a function that's infinity when f i of x is greater than zero. Okay, so if f i if f one of x equals one, for example, this will be infinity. Okay, so it'll make our objective positive infinity. So in order to get a value of our objective that is finite, then all of these constraints need to be satisfied. So where i minus is the indicator function for non-positive reals. In other words, i minus of u is equal to 0 if u is less than or equal to 0, and positive infinity, don't need the plus, positive infinity if u is greater than 0. So you can see that unless all the constraints are satisfied, our objective is, has an, a value of positive infinity, and we definitely haven't minimized it. Okay, so this is gradually turning into a form that is um, a little more useful but we're not there yet. We still can't use Newton's method as our objective is not differentiable, obviously. Okay, you're suddenly finite that you jump to positive infinity. It's about as non-differentiable as you can get. So let's have a look at what we can do to deal with this. So this, our indicator function basically looks like this. Actually, you don't need such a long x-axis. Um, essentially looks like this. It has a value of 0 up until we hit 0. And then it shoots off 
to positive infinity. That's it. <laughs> okay, now that's very non-differentiable, and we can't use it in Newton's method. The idea is, what if we could have replaced this with something that's similar? Okay, what if we could come up with a function, for example, that looks like this? Okay, um, that looks a bit like our indicator function. It's not it, but it looks pretty close. So if we could come up with a continuous function that looks like this, and maybe we could, maybe it could be influenced by a parameter that means that as your parameter got larger or something, it looks more and more like that. Then we could replace this differentiable thing by all of these, so all of these i minus of u's with some differentiable replacement and that would make our objective differentiable and continuous. Okay, so what is this, what is a good candidate function for this type of thing? Well, a little bit of thinking about it and you can see that this actually looks like the graph of log. Okay, just log x, what does that look like? Um, you should all know how to draw a graph of log. That looks like what I've got here. It goes down to negative infinity. Okay, so this just looks like this thing kind of reversed and flipped a bit. So what we use here, um, kill that picture because I want need, need the space in a moment. We soften the indicator. Um, to a continuous approximation. Okay, and what is that? I hat minus of u is equal to negative 1 over t log minus u. Okay, so t is greater than zero is a parameter that sets the accuracy of the approximation. Okay, if you make t very large, then it gets closer and closer to looking like our blue indicator function. Okay, so what happens? if we plug that into our problem, so substituting in we get um, minimize f naught of x plus the sum from i equals 1 to m negative 1 over t log negative fi of x subject to ax equals b. Okay, so what is this? Well, we've now got a continuous objective function at least up until x equals 0, up until f, well, while we're feasible anyway, subject to some constraints, equality constraints. Now it turns out this objective function, our new objective, is actually continuous and convex. And convex. And so we can use Newton's method to solve it. Okay, so basically, I'm not going to detail, there are quite a few um, important details here, which if you get it wrong, means the algorithm won't work at all. Because what happens is, as t gets big, this problem becomes very badly conditioned. So if you don't have a good starting point, you end up with um, junk as your answer, basically, and it won't work. So the way, the way it works is we solve 
the equality constraint problem for a particular value of t. Okay, so you might start with a reasonably small value of t. Okay, this means the derivatives are relatively nice and not too, yeah, rather smooth. And if you, st if you start with a fairly low value of t, then you can get a solution to an approximation of your problem. Okay, and then increase t. Using the optimum as the start point. for the next iteration. Okay, so you set t to be relatively small, you solve the approximate problem, that will give you an x that is an approximation of your actual solution. You then increase t by some amount um, and do it again. Every time you do that, you get closer and closer to, to solving your true problem, and because you're always starting nearby for the Newton's method, it's always so long as you choose your values of t sensibly, it will always converge. Okay, as t tends to infinity, the approximation becomes exact. Okay, so why am I telling you this? Well, this is kind of one of the main ways, and possibly the main way now, that we solve optimization problems like these, okay, including linear programming. So this approach, or more sophisticated variations of it, is widely used in practice. and is known as an interior point method. Okay, this is because unlike methods like the active like the active set or simplex method, when you've got your feasible region, then you can start in the middle of it. And as you solve approximations to your problem, let's say our optimum's up here somewhere then what you might get is a sequence of solutions to these Newton's method problems that looks like this. Okay, that basically eventually converges to your problem. Okay, so they don't bounce around the edges of the feasible region like the simplex method does. It starts in the interior and hones in on the solutions. So that's why it's called an interior point method. Okay, um, LP, interior point LP solvers perform, or at least it's, they're regarded as performing at least as well, and often better. than the simplex method. Okay. And finally these methods for convex optimization are very important in practice. And if you look on the internet, if you look in Google Scholar for convex optimi optimization, you'll find that it's um, a very active research area as well.
Okay, so okay, there's one last thing I wanted to show you before we finished off. Um, just a bit of fun for those of you who, particularly for those of you who are enjoying the MATLAB programming aspect of this course. These interior point solvers. Um, well, let's have a look. A friend of mine at Stanford. We've sort of been in, in, involved in creating linear programming solvers that are as short as you can possibly generate in MATLAB. Okay, so believe it or not, this here solves a LP in standard form in a single line of 75 characters in MATLAB. Okay, so this is an interior point method, not the one I just told you, it's actually a different type. It's based on an ellipsoid algorithm, but um, thought you might enjoy trying this out. In one line of MATLAB code you can solve an entire standard form linear program. The only catch is you have to start with a feasible x, okay, so an x that satisfies your constraints. And over the last couple of years, some more people have come up with um, even smaller ones. The most impressive one just came up recently, and 49 characters solves an LP in standard form. Okay, so if, if you're interested, you can go to that website up there and check it out for yourselves and have a bit of a play with that in MATLAB. You'll find that it's that the cost of having a very small program is that it doesn't perform very well and it's quite slow. But hey, it gives you the solution, so that's pretty cool. Alright, well this is about the end of where I wanted to get to in this course, so remember that this lecture is not going to be examinable in the final test, but yeah, I guess I'll see you back in class when we have our tutorial and things next week. So until then, 